everybody to the um, Tampa Press Department of Art um, Visiting Artists Series. And um, I'd like to um, thank Francis Myers for bringing a lot of students. <laughs> We're delighted to see you all here this afternoon. And this lecture has been funded by a most generous grant from the Anonymous Fund, so we thank them. We're delighted this afternoon to welcome um, the artist David Shapiro, who's making his first visit to Tandem Press. Um, David Shapiro was born in Brooklyn, New York, and received his BFA from the Pratt Institute and his MFA from Indiana University in Bloomington. He's taught at many distinguished institutions, including Western Michigan University at Kalamazoo, the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, Barnard College in New York, and the Parsons School of Design. He exhibits frequently throughout the United States, including the Lowe Gallery in Atlanta, the New Gallery in Washington, D.C., the Sherry Leedy Gallery of Contemporary Art in Kansas City, Perimeter Gallery in Chicago, and at many galleries overseas, including the Fine Arts Society in London, and at international biennales in Japan, Finland, and Ljubljana in Yugoslavia. According to the author Mason Riddle, his paintings and prints comprise a highly personal language of signs and symbols. Circles, spirals, dots, wave and knot patterns, stylized flames and textures resonate on a richly hued tactile surfaces of Nepalese and Japanese papers, burlap, burlap nylon screening, and canvas all of which evoke a subtle mood of contemplation. He will speak to you more about this, but just let me conclude by saying that his work is included in many public and private collections, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Solomon Guggenheim Museum, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina. Please join me in welcoming David Shapiro. Uh, thank you, Paula, for the wonderful introduction. Um, and thank everybody here for coming tonight. It's been a great pleasure for me to come here. And uh, as my first visit to uh, Tandem Press, uh, it's been very exciting to me. Uh, those of you who here who make prints, um, you never think you're going to get anywhere, get, any, get anything. And as of yesterday, I thought, oh my god, I should have stayed home. <laughs> but as of today, I think I'm really coming up with something that's really good, thanks to the good help and uh, encouragement of the people that I've been working with. So, uh, so far, it's been a wonderful project. Um, when asked to speak about uh, one's work, it's always a, a difficult Thing, particularly after following, hearing an art critic, whatever they said about me, and uh, to follow that, follow that up, um, you know, and I thought about it, so what am I going to say about my work? Uh, it's a dangerous thing to say too much about your work. You want people to look at it and to respond uh, to it for, you know, what they see rather than what they know, and maybe knowing comes after seeing, I'm not quite sure. Um, so, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a few brief thoughts I have about what uh, meaning means to me, and then I will show you some slides and the work that covers from, you know, loosely 1974 to the present. Uh, and when I said, and then hopefully there'll be some questions you might want to ask. I, I much prefer questions than uh, me, you know, postulating on what I'm, I'm trying to do. Um, I'm quote unquote an abstract artist. And the problem I've always had in my life and career has been people say, well, what, you know, what do you what do you do? I say, well, I'm an abstract artist, quote unquote. Well, what next? What is what does that mean? You know, what do you what are your what are you about? And 
When I was an art student, I always think about this when people ask me this now, but when I was an art student, I was lucky enough to go to school. I went to Pratt Institute. I was very lucky to have Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, came there as a uh, visiting scholar and spent a week at the school giving talks and kind of hanging out with the students and going to coffee with the students. And a thing that he stressed at that time uh, was uh, what he, as he said it, metaphor. If any of you saw his PBS special, he kept referring to it as metaphor, which you know we call metaphor maybe. And uh, to find a metaphor for your life, he kept stressing that. And uh, it always stayed with me. And later on when I you know, started to do my work, I started to think about you know, what is the uh, metaphor that I can use for my work as an abstract artist, as a quote unquote abstract artist. Because to describe directly, you know, metaphors are used to describe things indirectly. And um, to describe what I do directly is sort of against my nature to begin with. Uh, I'm a cancer, horoscopically, which some of you know is a crab who never moves forward, always moves sideways or backwards. So it's hard for me to be pinned down. So uh, looking for a metaphor to describe what it is I do, what it is I'm interested in, uh, rather than giving an explicit direct answer. And in thinking about um, a metaphor for abstract art, or my particular kind of abstract art, I thought about um, how do we know, what do we know about ourselves as a civilization? You know, what evidence do we have of where we've been, where we're going to? And uh, the earliest uh, examples of our so-called civilization and culture uh, come primarily through archaeological uh, relics of, say, pottery shards and uh, textiles, bits of cloth, and we can tell a lot about our history and our prehistory from these things. And taking that a step further, I was thinking, well, what is the central metaphor of pottery? And I thought about, well, it's centering. That's the whole process of pottery, of centering, of building a form from the inside out. And uh, what is the central metaphor of uh, textile, of weaving? Well, it's the warp and the weft. It's this uh, grid that you form in two directions, the horizontal and the vertical, that has no center. It reaches out infinitely. So you have two different metaphors that are totally opposite in meaning. And of course, I decided, well, the central metaphor for my work, I want to join the two that are mutually exclusive. <laughs> I want my work to be about centering. And at the very same time, I want it to be about reaching out infinitely in all directions. Um, this process, uh, you know, you could say it's akin to, say, something like breathing. You know, how can these things exist at the same time? Well, it's just like breathing. There's the in-breath and the out-breath. You can't just breathe in. You must breathe out. Uh, and you can kind of look at it metaphorically as the in-breath is the centering, and the out-breath is the warp and the weft is the reaching out infinitely in all directions. Uh, this chain of events is also very much like what happens in meditation. In the focusing of energy into the breath, a whole chain of thoughts and feelings are generated and considered. Um, this process continues until it's ended arbitrarily by time constraints, uh, wandering attention span, and maybe outside stimuli. Uh, as I thought about it, I said, well, this is very much like doing my work. You know, like, how do I know when I'm finished with my painting or my print or my drawing? You know, I get hungry. <laughs> I run out of energy. Um, 
if any of you have ever meditated, I think you know, you'd have a similar experience that, uh, you know, when is your meditation over? You know, it's when your attention wanders far enough, you can't bring it back to a center point. Um, in attempting to do my work in, this, this, in the spirit of what I'm talking about, I hope to unite my inner and my outer life and to have a viewer have some sort of identification, not with any kind of specific subject matter, but the whole process of inner and outer, uh, possibly going as far as um, dealing with qualities that might seem opposite of each other and taking them into consideration. Um, in my work, I strive to be mindful of the following qualities. Um, deludedness, concentratedness, lightness, darkness, tenderness, power, potentiality, manipulation, introversion, extroversion, anecdotal, parable, <clears throat> near, far, clear, clouded, singular, multiple, mutability, permanence, expressive, expansive, and gathered. Now, all these words taken together, you know, it's like stating a condition, then it's, it's opposite. And uh, this is something that I've always been interested in doing in my work, and as I said, to find the central metaphor for my work in doing this. Um, I recently came across a quotation that I hung on my studio wall that I thought was wonderful from the great French film director, Jean-Luc Godard. <clears throat> and it's a real admonition. It says, you have to confront vague ideas with clear images. And as an abstract artist, I could say, well, all my ideas are really vague. I, I, it's hard to describe what they are. But my task as an artist is to find a clear image that is articulate enough to express some something about these ideas. And when I say they're vague ideas, they're ideas that can't be pinned down to any one element. Um, <clears throat> okay, I think, I, I think I've said enough. And uh, I'm going to start to show you some slides, and I'll talk about the pictures as, I, uh, you know, as we come across them and tell you, talk to you a little bit about what you're seeing. Okay, can we, can we start? Oh, do I start? Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is a uh, painting from 1974. And I started in 74 because I feel like this is when I first began to do my first uh, work where I had some kind of idea about what I was trying to do or I had some technical ability to, to try to achieve what I wanted to do. And <clears throat> I would imagine seeing the slide looks like dust on the wall. It's hard to see what actually is here. But uh, this is a painting, a quite large painting, that was an homage to Mark Rothko. Uh, I painted it after he had died. And I wanted to express my uh, feelings of admiration and uh, to him as an artist for influencing me and for giving me so much pleasure in, in looking at his art. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a backwards R floating down there at the bottom. It's red. Is it visible? I can't tell from here. Anyway, the backwards R is in the Russian alphabet, the, word, the letter for I, the I. And it was a way of me putting myself into uh, this whole spirit of, of, my, of uh, Rothko. And there's a broken line there, which had something to do with the end of his life. Uh, the painting is done, uh, something I've always been interested in is just the process of painting was uh, painting through screens. Was, so getting a buildup of uh, paint from the very edges, which are very heavily painted, to the center, which is very thinly painted, but everything is painted through a screen, whether it's like window screening. All, I used all different kinds of window screening and any kind of uh, screen I could find. Uh, this was a painting in the same 
series at the time, in 1974, where all my attention was cast down. I was very interested at the time in uh, statues of Buddhas, which always seemed to have these, this incredible expression of down, you know, looking downward. The eyes were always heavily lidded and looking down and in. And I started to think about posture, like when you look at a painting, how do you relate your body to what's in front of you, like shoulders, where are your shoulders, where are the shoulders of the painting? And to try to get inside the painting by like focusing it into a specific area, down and in. Uh, this is a painting also from the early 70s, following what you just saw. Uh, and this is from a series called The Poignancy of Things. I became very interested in uh, all things Japanese. And there's an expression in Japanese culture, sono no aware, which means the poignancy of things, that it's used uh, in describing pottery or uh, things in nature. And it has to do with the evanescence of uh, life, of things of like wasting away or peeling away of layers, or the autumn is a good time for, in Japanese culture because you have the leaves turning from green to red to brown to dust. Uh, there's a sadness, there's a sweet sadness about this change. And these paintings were done as like large monoprints, that there's no brushwork in these paintings, that everything you're seeing was uh, painted with the thing that's represented. I would cut up pieces of cardboard or wood or find things in the street or find things in my studio and dip them in paint and press them into the canvas, uh, leaving their impression. But when you remove the object, you're also removing half of what you put there. This is another painting from that series. This is the uh, first print I ever made. This is from 1979. Uh, and this is a uh, lithograph and silkscreen print called Suki, S-U-K-I. And uh, Suki is a Japanese word which um, I found in reading a book about sword fighting, Japanese sword fighting. And Suki is a word that in, this, in that context means penetrating your opponent's defense with the idea that you've never finished penetrating your opponent's defense. You have to keep moving forward and deep into space. That you're, As you're penetrating your opponent's defense, they're reacting to you and moving against you. So it's a constant moving back and through all of these activities. And I thought this was particularly apt for dealing with uh, printmaking or painting or any, any kind of image making is that every time you make a mark, you're having to deal with where that mark is and what do you do in relationship to it and how do you move around it through it and how do you compose a whole picture. And this actually, this print was printed on both sides of the paper. It's on a very thin Japanese paper. So the print, what you're seeing, the imagery you're seeing is on both sides of the paper and what's on the back is coming through to the front. Uh, this is a painting from the uh, early 80s of another series of pieces I worked on called Subtle Body. And uh, I get the title Subtle Body from uh, in yoga or in Buddhism is what's called the subtle body. And that's the body beneath and behind uh, the corporeal body. And it's that body that feels uh, all the sensations that register on a very low level that might not even be on a conscious level. And it had to do with suffusing that imagery that appeared earlier in the uh, poignancy of things uh, 
in this kind of bath of light and color. This is another painting from that uh, series of subtle body. And as you can see, the paintings are all over. And at this point, I began to notice in my work, I seem to have an allergy to putting anything, to having like a central point of interest. It, uh, and it wasn't an ideological uh, kind of a feeling for me. It just seems like I couldn't compose a picture with having a center of interest. As I had learned when I was in art school, that you should always have like, uh, you know, a, or, you know, a subject matter that was right there, if not in the center of the picture, but it was the main thing in the picture in which everything else revolved around. Uh, again, from that series of uh, subtle body. This is a painting from 1977, and this is you know, contemporary with what you just saw. And this is a painting called Burnham Wood. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, you know, the reference Burnham Wood, but for those of you who don't, in Shakespeare's Macbeth, um, witches tell Macbeth that he'll be the king until Burnham Wood moves to Dunsany Castle. And Macbeth, of course, thinks that uh, this will never happen. How can the forest move to the castle? And uh, in a Japanese v movie version of, uh, of Macbeth, Throne of Blood by Akira Kurosawa, there's this incredible scene in the movie where Macbeth's enemies <coughs> Uh, advance in the, on the castle in a fog behind branches of trees. And Macbeth's, or Lord, whatever his name was, uh, who was the Macbeth figure in this movie, uh, his, his soldiers see this. They see the forest advancing on the castle, and of course they abandon their master. And Macbeth loses his crown, uh, thinking this would never happen. How could the castle, how could the forest move to the castle? And it was a very, had the, that, have, that image had a very powerful effect on me. At the same time, when there was a, I was getting some static from people who told me that my work was too soft. And I thought, well, how can I make a tough painting? Cause, and it was a feeling in the air in the uh, late 70s of uh, wanting to do tough, quote unquote, tough work. And I thought of this image of something that was impossible to happen, and I thought, well, I'm going to put two different worlds together in the same painting, and I'll do it on a diagonal, which will make it even harder to look at, because then everybody will say, well, which side do I look at first? Or you know, people would look at this and tilt their heads, and they look at it you know, and say, well, which side is which? And the forms were so different from one another, and uh, I also got to thinking about how we use language when we look at art and think about words like moving or touching. You know, when we have some kind of emotional experience, we say that was very moving or that was very touching. And when I would see people, you know, tilt their head to look at my painting, I would say, oh my God, I've moved, they're moving. <laughs> it's, it's a moving experience. Now, it might not be in a deeply emotional way, but I thought that these words are used not by accident, that there's something physical that happens when you can look at a work of art. That, that again, as I talked about with the um, Rothko painting that I showed you, um, with the shoulders of the painting, or looking down and in in a painting, of some way of a painting having some uh, relationship to human scale and to uh, physicality in a way that makes you feel like you're in some sort of relationship with the picture rather than just looking at it over a, you know, whatever viewing distance, that you actually engaged in it in a physical way. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of these Burnham wood images. These are very large paintings. These are you know, seven, six or seven foot high paintings.
this is a uh, lithograph uh, paint, uh, lithograph from the mid 80s that I called Burnham Wood. Uh, slightly different format than the paintings. Uh, it's a very large lithograph and uh, slightly, you know, different configuration of forms. Uh, this is an etching from about the same time of another Burnham Wood image. Um, this is a painting from the early 80s called Pleasure of the Road. And when I talked about physical aspect of uh, painting or, or image making, because I'm not only talking about painting, it's also prints and drawings and uh, anything that's visual. Uh, and the same theme of physical and of having, you know, like where does the painting come from also. I started running at that point in my life. And uh, every morning I'd go out to the park and I would run, you know, five miles. And for the first time in my life, I actually became aware of myself as the motive body moving through space. You know, it seems like a funny revelation, but I'm sure some of you have had this feeling of uh, and seeing the landscape go by me as I was running, seeing it pass by me peripherally, and uh, gave me an idea to do paintings that were like running through the landscape. I would encounter like brief glimpses of everything as I was running through that landscape. Now, of course, this is not a literal transcription of the trees in the park and people in the park, but uh, more of a, a haptic kind of uh, reaction to what I was feeling as I was engaged in that kind of activity and feeling my breathing. Again, from that series, these are uh, 12 foot long paintings. Uh, this is a uh, picture from the late 80s called Clearing. It was another series I engaged in and um, related to all the things that came before but formatted as the two situations next to each other. Uh, a side-by-side -side situation rather than a continuous kind of situation. Now this is a clearing painting from the late 90s and just have to interject here that very often in my work I work in series obviously so you've already seen and sometimes I'll work for you know whatever number of years on a specific series and then it sort of runs dry. There's nothing left for me to add to that. I, I don't have another idea for that kind of image or that kind of format. And then 10 years might go by and then all of a sudden there it is again in a little bit different form. And one thing that's very important to me about my work is that it should be <coughs> self-generating. That I like for the work to give me an idea of what comes next, that I don't have to go looking for ideas, that to do a work with a kind of a level of complexity, that there's always something for me to do, uh, even if it has to do with scale, uh, changing scale of something, changing material. I love to work in many different kinds of material, even with the same idea, to see how the idea feels in many different um, media you know, a print of this, which is actually what I'm engaged in at the moment, actually here at Tandem Press. Like, I never thought I would ever do a clearing print, because <laughs> uh, this basically was something that started a long time ago, and then all of a sudden it came to me when I was asked to come here, what did I want to do? And this sort of flipped into my mind that this is what I wanted to work on. Um, but with a different level of understanding of what it was I started to do, and with a different set of conditions. Uh, this is a piece from the mid-80s. This is a monoprint 
um, called Twice Told Tale. And again, this is another series, and it's contemporary with a lot of the other things you're seeing, and I like to work on many different series at the same time. Um, and Twice Told Tale is another way of presenting two different conditions at the same time. Again from Twice Told Tale. <coughs> Uh, in the late 80s, I started in, on work on this series, which I called Kala, K-A-L-A, which is a uh, Indian, which is a Sanskrit word, which had to do with um, change of epoch. Like in uh, Hindu mythology, every 10,000 some odd years, the world changes. It goes from Brahma's night to Brahma's day, you know, that all forms discombobulate and become other forms every 10,000 years in their mythology. And uh, I thought about doing a series of works where there would be these parallel worlds which would have this funny cusp, this edge in which they met and about the transition from one to the other. And this is a painting on canvas. And this is also from that same series. Now, as a technical note, I might say that, like, I'm always looking for new ways of working and new materials to work in, and, uh, and very often contrasting two different ways of applying material in one image. And what you see here on the bottom half is a uh, painting. And what you see on the top part is painting combined with what I call negative rubbing is I composed a uh, picture on the floor in my studio with uh, string. And I put the canvas down on the floor and then I sanded the canvas revealing what was underneath, this composition that was underneath. And it had also to do with two levels of reality and one since one part of the painting was being built from the back forward and the top part was being from the front backward to have these two conditions existing simultaneously. This is a uh, etching from 1990 of the uh, Kala series. And this illustrates another thing that I'm interested in, in, particularly in my print work and my, any of my work on paper, as I love to work on handmade papers that have color, and that could be natural color. But in this case, this was a French paper that came in, uh, I don't know, about six, seven different colors. And I don't start a printmaking project without the paper. Like, I always say the paper gives me the idea for the piece. I really don't have ideas for prints until I see a paper which inspires in me an idea for that particular uh, material. And one thing that working on a colored paper does, it already provides you with one level of information to work off of. Uh, this is another piece from that series. And of, often with prints, I, uh, it's hard to make one print, like a solitary image. Uh, or I find it hard to do that. And I like to work in groups of uh, usually 10, if I can do it. It's hard to sustain doing 10. But like this is from a suite of six images. Uh, this is another series I was working on in the uh, early 90s called Mirror. And again, it had to do with the dichotomy of one side mirroring the other, but being in a totally different condition. This is a very large uh, print of the same image, same kind of image, same subject matter. 
And in this one, I actually, one of the few times in my life, I actually did something constructive as a, like a carpenter. I'm not a very handy person. But I actually built that grid out of wood. It's a large piece. It's about a six foot high print and uh, was thrilled when I actually inked it up and printed this thing I had built. <laughs> and it actually worked. And it put into contrast two totally different things. There was the construction element, and then there was the drawing with like the full arm, you know, working from the shoulder with the brush on a plate on the other side. Again, these two worlds existing in one. Uh, also from the uh, late 80s, early 90s, a series of pieces which were called Arjuna. And Arjuna is a title that's taken from uh, the Indian epic, the Bhagavad Gita, which is a uh, wonderful story of uh, Arjuna, who's the uh, protagonist in this story, uh, going to Lord Krishna on the occasion of uh, him having to have to go into battle against his uh, family, members of his family who usurped the uh, crown, that it was his father who was the king and his cousins uh, have taken over and he has to go into battle and he doesn't want to go into battle with his relatives and kill them and he's looking for uh, advice on uh, a plan of action or how to act or if he should act and uh, Lord Krishna gives him a threefold plan to action and um, this inspired me to do pieces very rare in my work to deal with odd numbers, but a threefold path to action in the sense of, and it's not a literal description of the story I just told you, but it's a putting together picture in three steps with one leading to the other. Uh, again in Arjuna. These are very large uh, paper pieces which are done as combinations of uh, mono printing and uh, painting or dyeing paper. In this instance, very uh, heavy uh, paper, like say up on the top and on the bottom, a, a tissue thin piece of paper from Nepal, which had dyed a uh, yellow color. Uh, this is in the same series, and this is a piece that's made out of paper pulp. Um, which is something that I love to do, is make paper, and uh, particularly make paper with the image already embedded in the paper. And so again, it's a very large piece. This is about seven feet high. This is, uh, I'm going to have a memory lapse now. I'm trying to remember the title of this piece. But anyway, whatever the title is, this was done around that same time and this is a combination of acrylic paint on heavy paper and dry point etching on gauze on the bottom. And it was, again, the combination of the solid with the ephemeral, the constructed versus uh, the unconstructed. Um, same piece in the same series painted on burlap. Uh, I had done a project at a press and I noticed these burlap sacks hanging around which were used to clean up, you know, to wipe the ink away and just to soak up oil and stuff. And I said, you know, what are, and I love the color of the, this was just garbage actually, it was just, I love the way the color looked on the burlap. And I said, well, you know, where do you get those, uh, uh, Burlaps, what, what are they? And they told me they were feed bags, you know, for uh, farm animals. And I had them take me to the, to the feed bag store where I bought all these uh, burlap bags and I cut them open and uh, prepared them and did a whole series of paintings on them. This is a uh, print from the early 90s. Um, taking off from the same idea, but on paper. Uh, 
This is a piece also from the uh, early 90s that I called The Lady and the Samurai, and they were made out of uh, paper and, and or paper and gauze or paper and nylon screening. And I had this idea of uh, putting what I called masculine imagery and feminine Im imagery together in one piece. Um, and like to leave it to every individual to decide which is the masculine part and which was the feminine part. The circle is always taken as to be a feminine form, but imposing it into this big cross and taking the masculine form, the square, and putting it in this very thin, gauzy material. Again, from that series. This is a piece from, you know, about five years ago, four or five years ago. Uh, and this is cast paper and silk. And this is a piece that's probably about four and a half, five feet high. And it's painting and dyeing the uh, silk. The silks are an interesting story, as I, I've always loved silk as a material. And when I was a child, I saw a demonstration, uh, which is something that's always you know, stayed with me, something that's been very important to me, actually. I saw a demonstration where a man <coughs> held up a piece of silk, and another man, at some distance, fired a gun at the silk. And rather than the silk being, you know, with a shot through with a hole, the silk lifted <laughs> and the bullet went under the silk. That the air pressure or the speed of the bullet caused the silk to move. And it had, this had something to do, I found out later, with martial arts, you know, of not, resist, not, resistant, not resisting was the way to succeed or not to be damaged. Um, so I was always interested in silk as a material. I always thought this was a beautiful thing as a veil and had this strength, actually, in silk materially is very hard to tear. And uh, I found uh, somebody who made uh, new clothing out of old kimonos, old Japanese kimonos. And the old Japanese kimonos had these linings, these silk linings, which this person was discarding because there was no use for them, and there was no pattern on them. So I bought them by the pound. <laughs> you can imagine how many silks you can get in a pound. And um, so these are all pieces made with 100-year-old, 120-year-old <coughs> silks that I dyed myself. They all come in natural colors. And I had to learn how to make, how to dye silk. Again from that series. This is a piece from another series which started probably in the uh, early to mid-90s called Mudra, M-U-D-R-A. And a Mudra is, um, for those of you who don't know, is a hand gesture. If you look at statues of a Buddha, you see two hands of the Buddha making two separate gestures. And they all have very esoteric, they're like thousand different mudras that uh, you know, are possible. But they activate a very small space between the hands. It has to do with this binary thing, that there's no action without the two elements. And I had been doing these pieces, which I'll show you in a few minutes, which were very large, six-panel paintings and prints. And after a while of doing them, I wanted to take like one of the panels and letting them step forward as actors in their own regard. And I thought of this word mudra as an appropriate thing to call them because they'd be small. This is a piece that's about 12 inches square. Small little charged gestures that took two things to activate them. And in this case, it was inner and outer. It was back and front. What you have here is a very heavy piece of cast paper that's been painted, and you have like an etching set into it.
And here they go side to side rather than back to front. And these are cast paper and gauze. This is a series of uh, etchings that were done uh, maybe two years ago, three years ago, also from the same series mudra. These are about 18 inches square. This is a painting of the same series, say around the same time. The knotted form is interesting to me is that back in, I didn't show you any slides of this, but in the early 70s I did many drawings and uh, some pieces that had to do with a knot. They all had knots in them. And, um, After a while, they worked out of, you know, they disappeared from my work. And then around this time, they started to come back to my work, but as unfurled knots, like knots that were untying themselves. This again is a canvas. This is a uh, painting from the early 90s called Savasan, S-A-V-A-S-A-N. Any of you who do yoga might be familiar with Shavasana, which, um, for those of you who don't know, is a yogic uh, pose, which is called the, the uh, lying down posture, dead man posture. And uh, it's a form of meditation where one lies down and takes into consideration what are called the chakras of the, of the body, which there are seven. Um, in doing this form of meditation myself, form of yoga myself, it dealt with an association between each one of these chakras which are located in different parts of your body and a visual association. And the visual association would keep changing. For instance, in your throat center, say you were lying there and you felt, had feeling in your throat and you visualized, say, a tree. And then it would change and the center would move to your stomach and you saw in your mind's eye like a hole in the ground. And this thing, if you pay attention to it, kept shifting and changing and sometimes it's just like a feeling uh, your foot falling asleep maybe or something like that. But it's about the constant shifting of attention and the imagery that arises from paying attention to it, of all the images that appear in your mind's eye. Uh, so I thought of taking this and translating this into a visual form, hence the Savasan uh, images. And I thought of, instead of doing seven, I'd do six panels, and the seventh would be the entirety of the whole piece. And this is a series which is... Uh, you know, ongoing to this day, actually, from the uh, late 80s, actually, to this day. And this is the piece, or the kind of piece, that produced the Mudra works, where I said, take one piece out of context and let it be an actor in its own regard, without full orchestration. This is a uh, Savasan uh, etching from... Uh, you know, a few years ago. And I've been working on a, a whole series of Savasan etchings probably since the uh, early 90s. I think I'm up to number uh, 15 now. I've done 15 Savasan etchings since the early 90s. Again, from the same series of etchings. These are all six feet long. And this is number 15. This is the very last one that I did a few years ago. And this is a uh, Savasan painting that I just completed this last year. This is about 11 feet long. And it strikes me as, 
you know, after, like I said, working on an idea for on and off for a number of years, like why is this different than one that was done, you know, 10 years earlier? And the whole sense of color and touch have changed for me. I mean, I, I look at it and I say, you know, I can't believe how, using the same material, how much it has changed. This is a painting from the uh, mid-90s, which might seem like a real shock considering the other imagery. This is a series of works I call Crossing the Mirror, which grew out of the last panel of all the Savasan works, which I always call the dissolution panel. It's where all the images that came before it would just seem to dissolve into just drifting away. And uh, I started to think about doing something that was not in panels, it was not in sections, but just to do a single image, but using the image, perversely maybe, to let everything dissolve that had gone before it. This was a series of paintings I did that were five or six feet square. And in these works, I started to deal with something else that you know, might be of interest to you. I started to think about energy when you work, like what do you work with, you know, and I started to pay attention to my breathing. And I got hold of these brushes that have like five fingers, five or six fingers. They're used in decorative painting for marbleizing. And I would dip them in the paint and I would take a deep breath and I would start on the upper left and as my breath was going, go to the extreme right and to try to train myself to do it in a straight line or as straight a line as I could with concentration and with the breath, with one, let the breath move my hand across and to do the whole painting that way, across, 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 down and to let the painting almost become like a, a meditation exercise in breathing. This is a etching from, uh, I think, 1985. Very large, this is a six foot high etching. And this is called Seer, Actor, Knower, Doer. Which is a title I arrived at from just playing word games in my mind and came out to see was to act, to act was to know, to know was to do. When you complete that cycle, it continues again in a circle. To do is to see, and so on and so forth, forms a cycle. Um, and when I first did these works, uh, they were vertical. This is a piece that's a painting, monoprint, and fabric piece. morphed into horizontal pieces. This is a painting from the uh, year 2000. This is a recent uh, piece. And what you see of this kind of uh, very loose drawing, loopy kind of drawing, is a continuation of this interest I've had in the breath moving the arm. This is, uh, this is the last group of pieces that I'm going to show you from the most recent series that I've been working on. And this is called Origin and Return. And this came about because at a certain point I wanted to take those Savasan images, and, which were six equal squares, and try to do something on the same horizontal, but with changing the rhythm, you know, getting rid of the six and going to four, 
And I choose even numbers. I have, uh, I alluded to earlier, there was a piece was unusual because it had three sections, is that I have a phobia about odd numbers. And an odd number always implies a center. And if you have two, four, six, eight, ten, there's no center. Uh, but I wanted to change the rhythm of these pieces on the horizontal, so I came up with this idea of origin and return, like a starting point, you go to a, some other point and you return. Uh, this is a very large painting. This is about a 12 foot long painting. Are these, I, I can't tell from here, the, it seems like kind of, the color seems kind of dull. Is that as bright as uh, it gets with the projector? No, there's no projectionist. And these are all very recent paintings. It's, uh, which actually I'm preparing for an exhibition in Chicago in, in April, which will, these pieces that I'm showing you will be in this exhibition. And again, these big loopy lines grow out of this interest in breath again, that these gestures are made in one gesture or else it's no good. And I can only dip my brush, I allow myself only one dip into the paint and that's it. If it doesn't work, you know, I, I have to throw it away. This is uh, the same series on paper. These are paint, the next few things are going to be paintings on paper. And in the paper, I like to combine different kinds of paper, like this one will have paper from Japan, Nepal, Thailand, and I think the Philippines. It's like an all Asian uh, paint uh, piece here. Now this next group, this is the last group I'm going to show you, five images of a suite of etchings, uh, not etchings, they're uh, relief prints that I just uh, finished recently. These are giant prints, they're 88 inches long, <coughs> 22 inches high, and they're on handmade uh, paper that was made especially <coughs> for me, which was very exciting uh, to work that way, to have somebody who made paper, you know, say, Come, come visit me, look at my work, and do paper for me that was inspired by my work. That's it. Um, I'd be very happy to uh, answer any questions anybody, you know, might have. You have a tremendous Oriental influence mm -hmm. that it's consuming. Uh, where did you get that? Well, it's a mystery to me because my background is totally uh, devoid of any uh, oriental aesthetic. I, uh, I went to high school in Levittown, uh, New York. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but it's like the archetypical tract house development where all the houses were identical and it was like in a kind of a lower middle class, working class environment. And there was nothing aesthetic in my environment um, and where this comes from, I have no clue, only that the first time I saw it, saw Oriental art or any, any kind of Oriental culture, I immediately had a feeling of some kind of identification. And I can tell you a couple of interesting stories where it might come from. Uh, my first studio in New York 
was in a building that's around the corner from where I live, and it was built in 1929. And it was built as it's the largest, it's a 29-story building, and it was built in 1929. And, no, it's not 29 stories. It's 18 stories, and it was built in 1929. And it was built because um, the daughter of the developer had been involved with a follower of Gurdjieff, you know, a Russian mystic, and talked her father, who was a real estate developer, into putting this building up for uh, artists and opera singers and cult people who were involved in culture and sort of followers of this mystic. His name was uh, Nicholas Rorick, who was a Russian. Uh, he was also a painter and um, collector of uh, Mongolian and Tibetan art. And, uh, you know, he had this whole following. And he, originally the building was built for the Nicholas Rorick Society. And uh, you know, it was filled with all these cultured people. Uh, over the years, the Rorick's got kicked out of the building and formed another museum somewhere else and took their collection of Tibetan and Mongolian art with them. And the uh, building, part of the building, became something called the Riverside Museum which was actually one of the first museums in New York to ever show minimal art in the early 60s. And I moved into the building next door, and I needed a studio. I worked in a second bedroom in an apartment, and I needed a studio very quickly. And I noticed that there was this, looked like an empty space in this building next door. And, uh, you know, it was rented, this beautiful, wonderful space. And after working there for 10 years, and in the 10 years I worked there, this is from 1970 to 1980, um, I had become interested in Buddhism and had gone into Zen, some Zen Buddhist training, and I'd become, you know, really, this had been a world I was really interested in. And as I was being kicked out of the building by a new real estate developer who had taken over the building, I discovered that the room that I had been working in for these 10 years, had originally been built as a Tibetan Buddhist shrine and library. And I acquired a photo of this uh, room that was taken when the building was built in 1929. And in the wall, and the wall I painted against, there had been a niche in that wall with a statue of a Buddha in it that had later been walled over. So when you asked me where did I get this interest, I mean, when I heard that, I sort of bowled me over. I said, wow, I can't believe that I've been working in this room, and it was an unusual room when I moved in there. I said, this is really a weird room. It was sort of what, what I call Tibetan deco. The building, the top of the building is like kind of a deco stupa. And I knew that part of the story, but I didn't know the history of the room I was in until I had to leave it. So I can ascribe some of my interest to something that just, you know, happened. Also, uh, when I first started to print, uh, the first printer I worked with, uh, you know, asked me, and I would, didn't know anything about printing. He said, what kind of paper do you want to work on? And I said, well, I don't know, you know, paper, you know, I don't know what kind of paper. And uh, it was not a really important thing to me at the time, paper. I didn't really think much about it, just like you bought it at the store and you drew on it or painted on it. And he showed me some Japanese papers. Uh, I said, well, look at these. And I looked at these Japanese papers and it was like, you know, like getting a new wardrobe from a high-class London tailor. I mean, this was like fantastic material, and I just got carried away with this stuff. I just thought it was just incredible stuff. It just spoke to me. And through that, actually, I became very, even more interested in the world of the Orient and, um, you know, more influenced by it. And, uh, you know, I've done a lot of reading and a lot of study, but where it actually originally came from, you know, if I... I really don't know. I know when I went, I went to Japan for the first time, I was very nervous. I was having an exhibition in Tokyo. And, you know, the, the influence is obvious. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, once I'm going to get there, they're going to laugh at me. You know, they're going to say, look at this American doing, uh, you know, Japanese painting. And, you know, they're going to think this is hysterical or be offended by it or something. And when I went to Japan, I actually had an incredible reaction that uh, I met this uh, uh, Japanese architect who told me, he said, 
to me, he said, you know, your paintings are so Japanese that Japanese people today are not even going to understand them. <laughs> 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 and um, when I was there, I, you know, I don't speak Japanese, and I just, I, I'm not a great traveler, and I, I just found myself feeling very much at home there, and I never got lost, and uh, I just had this incredible time of uh, walking around and exploring and seeing things, and I've, I've very rarely have had that feeling of feeling so at home in a place. Uh, you know, it was a wonderful experience, but where it comes from, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't believe in past lives or anything like that, so you know, I don't know what to ascribe it to. But it is, it's been an enormous influence uh, on me and on my life. I, I love the Japanese, uh, um, just, well, the aesthetic is obvious, but just the striving for a certain kind of uh, perfection. You know, that is a, to me this is a, there's something very moral about going for perfection, you know. But if you don't get there, it's okay because you keep doing more work. And like whenever I see Japanese art, it always seems perfect to me in its way with flaws. I mean, they, they love the flaw. When I talked before about the poignancy of things, it's like there's that beautiful leaf that's this incredible crimson, but it turns brown and turns to dust. You know, there's this recognition of all perfection just comes apart. It's not permanent. Actually, there's something I wrote down in my notes here, actually, I could quote to you, which is something I keep on my studio wall, that there's, there was a gentleman named Arthur Whaley, who was a great uh, Chinese scholar. And uh, he, his, I wrote down his characterization of a 13th century painting, Six Persimmons by Mu Qi, and the quote is, Passion congealed into stupendous calm. And, you know, when I read this, I just thought, wow, <laughs> what a, well, if I was able to do something like that or be that, passion congealed into stupendous calm. It's, again, it seems like a contradiction. Passion is fire. Stupendous calm. How do you reconcile those two things? Uh, I mean, to me, this was like a goal of perfection. You know, maybe you might not reach it, but what a, what a goal. It's like your bullet from the cylinder. Well, yeah, that, 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 that's it. I mean, I saw, that, I saw that demonstration when I was a child, and it always stayed with me. I said, wow, what an incredible thing. This flimsy substance, you know, gets out of the way of a, of a, of a bullet. What an amazing thing. Any, any other questions? Somebody must have a question. I mean, no questions? Hey, everyone. Uh, apart from the repetition of iconographies in the, in the work, the, consi the consistent structural repetition of a uh, uh, geometric unit next to or behind or connected to mm -hmm. another unit seems to be uh, in, in and of itself, metaphor, and, I, and I'm, I'm wondering how you think of exactly how color is used in transition and or abutment and or in conflict, and, and how you you know how you use those issues of, of so let's say plastic joinery uh, when when you're making the paintings. I don't I don't understand plastic joinery. Well, I just mean uh, symbolically or, or metaphysically. You know. When when two colors come together, oh, I see that that seems to be about something. Yeah, well, I think that uh, I, I think that every part of the painting or the print or what drawing or whatever we're talking about is 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 the most important part of the piece, and that every part has to be considered, and particularly the parts at, when you're dealing with say two different kinds of forms or two different kinds of color, that line or that edge. Uh, that becomes crucial. That's, a lot of attention has to be paid for it, and I think a lot of uh, thinking about what this signifies. You know, it's a transition, and um, if you kind of reflect, you know, make it again a metaphor, you know, like, and you think about your own life, for instance, there are those transitions in your life that you're usually only aware of in retrospect. It's hard to be aware of them as you're going through them. Uh, but as an artist, you have the luxury of something in front of you all the time, 
uh, which you, it's like yourself, but you're outside of yourself, looking at yourself in a way. And you can become aware of those transitions and in a way control them and say, well, uh, is an edge between, say, uh, black and white, is that going to be violent or is it going to be passive? And, uh, you know, it's, that is, that's an important issue to me and it's like a choice that I make and I, I like to structure the work that I have, on one hand, this contradiction again, of be choices and no choices, that at a certain point I'm doing something and I feel like I have to give up imposing my will on it and let it tell me what it wants me to do. But in another sense, you have to set it in motion to do that. I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, for the younger artists here, I think that's uh, an important lesson to be learned and to, to think about and it's hard to do when you're young because you say, well, how do you, where do you start? You, know, you need to generate some experience before you can do that. But uh, you know, like how do you do things that are gener generative, that keep generating themselves rather than always having to chase around looking for an idea? It takes time to find out what you're interested in, what you're really interested in. I don't know if that answers your question. Or what is going to, like if other people are going to come into your work and, and motivate you, like <coughs> a financial thing? So the, the, the what thing? A financial thing? Like financial. Are you going to be motivated by whether or not you're selling your work? Or if you, do you just continue to make what you care about? And how do you determine? Well, uh, you know, I, I, you know, yes, I mean, it's like, um, that's, I mean, that's, I mean, it, I'm going to say yes, but, you know, you know in the reality that it's, that it's, that I'm not saying it's not true for me, <laughs> but I know that, you know, the, the, everybody's under pressure to produce something, you know, that they can sell to, to do the next thing. Now, I think that uh, that's not the most important thing in your life, and it's, I don't think it's something to even worry about, you know, like, uh, you know, sometimes wish, well, I wish I had the problem, somebody coming up to me and saying, here's a million dollars, Paint me a red painting. <laughs> you know, do, a, do, a, do my portrait, and uh, here's a million dollars. And I say, oh my God, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, uh, I can't really answer that question. I haven't, I haven't been tempted that way myself. The only thing I can say is that some of the work that I've done personally, the most personal work I've done, which I never thought anybody would ever be interested in, turned out to be the most interesting work to other people than I ever, you know, I never anticipated. I, I'll, I'll tell you another personal experience, actually, to answer your question. This is a kind of a little funny story. I, at one time in my life, when I was young, when I was a young artist, I was really poverty-stricken. I had nothing. You know, I mean, I was, and I had a real problem managing money or figuring out like my relationship to money. And I scared up enough money to go to a therapist, a psychotherapist, to deal with this problem. That all my friends said, you know, you should go see a shrink about this because she's just managing your finances. You're just going to, you know, you're just doing the wrong thing all the time. So I went to the psychotherapist and, you know, we talked about this problem, my relationship to money, because I said, well, money's no good. You, know, you shouldn't have, you know, artists shouldn't be involved with money. It's a real, you know, it's a real conflict for people you know, in the arts about money. And the guy suggest, said to me, he said, uh, well, why don't you just paint what's popular? <laughs> and you'll make a lot of money. And I said, oh, you're a charlatan. I can't do that. I can't uh, paint what's popular. And he said, well, why not? Do it for six months and make enough money. And then the other six months, you can do what you wanted to do. I said, no, that's the horrible, I said, I'm paying you to tell me this? It's like, you're, you're like the devil. It's a horrible thing to tell me. And, uh, you know, he said, no, no, I'm, I'm really serious. He said, you know, look at all those artists in the Renaissance and Baroque age and who did all those portraits of popes and uh, noblemen. You know, what do you think they were, you know, they, you know, they did their best work when they weren't painting those portraits. You know, they, you know, or you see their best work in the ruffles around the necks, not in the faces. So I said, okay, 
I'll give it a try. I finally, he finally talked me into it. So I started, started to do paintings, which were like what was very hot at the moment, which at that time happened to be color field painting. And I met with absolutely no success whatsoever. <laughs> Nobody was interested in them. They were terrible paintings. And I, I mean, I did this for about a month. And they just, you know, because they weren't done with any conviction. And they were just being done to make money. So I went back to what I was doing. And then, like I said, the, the works that I felt were from the deepest part of me, which I never expected anybody to be interested in, all of a sudden people got interested in them. So I have no idea really how to answer the question. It's like, I'm not going to tell anybody, you know, go for the money. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to have money, but um, there are more important things in life. And I think uh, the satisfaction you get in front of your own painting or print or whatever you're working on, I mean, there's no amount of money in the world that can buy that moment when you're standing in front of something where you felt you've realized something or dragged something out of yourself that you didn't even know was there. And there's no amount of money that can purchase that. So it's a matter of assigning values of uh, what you need in your life. I don't know if that answers your question. Any other questions? <laughs>